Okay, students, uh, let's begin lecture. Uh, we're going to have some homework over the weekend. It's not ready yet, uh, but it will be ready hopefully tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, and you can work over the weekend with it. We're going to be talking about energy today. And I'm going to uh, give you kind of a... Uh, four-dimensional thought process uh, to uh, justify or to establish why the concept of energy is, is what it is and uh, why it shows up in the equations of motion uh, of our universe anyways. Um, you'll note down at the uh, bottom right I have the SI schedule uh, marked up, and I should have done this, you know, weeks ago, but anyways, here it is, and uh, just so you know, there's uh, a session today at 1.30 to 2.20 in Engineering 1, room 383, and I'll have this table up, um, it's also up in web courses, um, Friday, tomorrow, 11.30 a.m., here's what it looks like in web courses, uh, so you can, you know, don't feel like you have to copy everything down right now. But yeah, try to get there. And even if you can only go for 15 or 20 minutes, definitely it helps. And people that are able to consistently attend uh, SI uh, over the semester uh, usually end up with a letter grade higher on average than people that can't. So, But we know that and not everybody can, but if you can do it, uh, it's definitely a nice one. And, and Maria's up here in the front row. She's in the morning section every Tuesday and Thursday taking notes. So she kind of knows what she she got an A in this class. She knows what she's doing on that basis. And this is the second semester of being an SI. So she's really getting the hang of things. Another thing I want to make uh, um, clear is uh, that Miss Caroline, pictured here on the right, uh, has office hours in the physical sciences building. PSB on Fridays at 1.30 to 2.30. And I know a few people have been going to see her, and you definitely can go and see her. Uh, this is a photo from finals week last semester uh, where both Darian and, and Caroline were helping me with that big stack of final exams. Uh, anyways, that, that'll be helpful uh, for you. Last thing I want to make a mention of is that uh, the exam, I, I finally uh, put up what you already knew um, if you had both your uh, Scantron and your clicking scores. But anyways, I just activated that this morning, uh, the exam one total. Or actually, I think I did it last night. All right. Now, any questions about that stuff? <coughs> SI, grades, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's keep going. Um, last time we talked about this collision model, uh, a bunch of freight cars in the, in the freight yard. There's a, another example of it worked out in your textbook. Um, and we're going to do a, an example of it together. Well, something similar to that. Um, not quite the same boxcar type collision, but uh, we're going to do that with the clicker questions in just a minute. We said that... Um, if the momentum is conserved, then the total momentum beforehand, which only resided in the moving boxcar, there was no momentum uh, in the three stationary boxcars, that had to be equal to the total momentum afterwards. And since it was uh, four boxcars locked together, uh, they fulfilled this particular uh, momentum uh, uh, statement as well. That's just the definition of momentum. Whatever the momentum is, it's mass times velocity. Okay, this is an object of, of four box cars, so it's like a big gigantic box car of mass 140,000 kilograms moving off at some new speed, V nu. And 
we were able to use the conservation of momentum and the definition of momentum to figure out uh, that new velocity. Now, I want to try another collision with you, so get your clickers handy. And we have a question coming up in just a minute. Uh, but instead of boxcars, we're going to do something a little bit more important. Uh, we're going to do a calculation uh, between a molecule uh, and a photon of light. And this is the molecule that we're going to talk about. This is um, a three-dimensional view or view of a three-dimensional model of what's called retinal. Now, retinal is the uh, molecule in the retina of your eye that responds to incoming light. It, it uh, bends and unbends uh, in response to photons of light hitting it. And if you're looking at anything at this very minute, you're getting photons of light from uh, whatever you're looking at. So if you're looking at that screen, light is reflected back towards you into your eye, and it activates these retinal molecules. This is the uh, molecule uh, inside your eye that fires when this thing uh, bends and unbends uh, into two different shapes, from one shape to the other and back, that triggers the optic nerve. And that optic nerve sends a signal into your brain, into the visual center of your brain, and you interpret that as an image, you know, the thing that you're looking at at a particular time. And your brain uh, is extremely powerful. And I don't care, uh, I don't care what your SAT score was, you know, whether you had a high SAT or a low SAT, your brain is amazing. And they say that little baby, and they know that little babies like two or three days, four or five days after they're born, they, they can barely do anything, but they can recognize the face of their mother from all the other faces that they see. We can't even get computers to do that reliably and quickly, but a little baby, just like that. Just after a few days of looking at their MOM, they can do that, and their, and their pop as well, I suppose. It's a fantastic. And it all starts with retinal, inside your retina. Anyway, so that's the top. And this is a fascinating molecule. By the way, the, um, the, the gray spheres in this picture are carbons, carbon atoms. The white ones are hydrogens. And the red one, there's only one red one there. That's oxygen. That's an oxygen molecule. So... Let's talk about these atoms and molecules. And to do calculations of momentum with molecules and atoms, it's good to use the atomic mass unit instead of kilograms because um, atoms and molecules are extremely tiny. All right. Now, the periodic table uses the atomic mass unit. Now, this number down here at the bottom, this is, this is the little tile or the little cell of the periodic table uh, for oxygen. And every chemical element, you know, from hydrogen all the way to uranium and beyond has its own cell. And it tabulates, you know, the name, the symbol, which is just O for oxygen, uh, the atomic number and the atomic mass. So the mass here is 15.99. And that uses the atomic mass unit which is about the mass of one proton. Officially, it is one twelfth the mass of the most abundant carbon uh, new, uh, atom in, in the world, and that's the car what we call carbon-12, six protons, six uh, neutrons. Uh, so 12 uh, nuclear units, and a twelfth of that is the atomic mass unit. It's about the mass of a proton. So hydrogen, which is just a, an... Um, uh, a proton and an electron uh, is pretty close to 1.00 AMUs. And you may say, well, Dr. B, what about the uh, electron? The electron is really teeny. 
compared to the proton and the neutron. It's about one two thousandth of the mass of a proton. So it, doesn't, it would come in on the third or fourth decimal point, something like this. All right. Uh, and same with all the other atoms. Oxygen, the most common form of oxygen uh, in all the water of Earth is uh, eight protons and eight neutrons, carb uh, oxygen 16. And so, and that's reflected in the periodic table. Uh, most mass, uh, most oxygen is, is 16 um, atomic mass units. Retinal is a bit bigger. Okay, it's not an atom, it's a molecule. So it's a bunch of carbons, oxygen, one oxygen, and a bunch of hydrogens um, bonded together in that particular pattern that you just saw. And its total mass is about 284 AMUs. All right. So when we're doing momentum, uh, P equals MV for uh, a molecule or an atom, it's good to use the AMU as your mass unit simply because the AMU is the, the mass of a proton, the atomic mass unit, is a very small fraction of a kilogram. So you don't have to use scientific notation if you're doing atomic mass units. So instead of kilogram meters per second, you would go, okay, uh, a hydrogen moving at one meter per second has a momentum of 1.00 AMU meters per second, all right? And here's what the equivalence is. One AMU meters per second is the same as 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 27 kilogram meters per second, which technically is correct, but it's kind of uh, uh, awkward carrying around all that scientific notation when you can use atomic mass units, all right? So, but you know, technically you can do all your calculations with kilograms and everything, but we're gonna do atomic mass units. So uh, an oxygen moving at 1.0 meters per second, that have a, a momentum of 16.0 AMUs meter per second, all right? And then the retinal at that same speed, 284 AMU meters per second. All right, so I'm going to be asking you some questions using the atomic mass unit system. And uh, just so that we can talk about molecules and not necessarily have to use 10 to the minus 27 kilograms and all that stuff. All right, so this is like a little uh, fast forward into the periodic table which we'll be tackling in April. Uh, but it's, it's fairly cinchy to work with this. So my emphasis is this is nice if you're talking about atoms and molecules. AMU meter per second if you're talking about kilograms. This is certainly true down here. 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 27 kilogram meters per second. Kilogram meters per second are okay for baseballs and humans and trucks and stuff like that at the human scale, but the atomic scale, yeah, you can use it, but why would you want to if you can use atomic mass units? Okay, so it's, it's six of one, half a dozen of another type of a situation, uh, but we're going to talk about atomic mass units and so forth. So here we go. Here's your clicker question, number one. A photon delivers a shot of momentum, 71.0 AMU meters per second of pure momentum to a retinal molecule that's at rest in the retina of your eye. How fast does the retinal move after absorbing the photon? And note, the photon is massless, so it doesn't have any mass. It does deliver momentum and energy, um, and the amount of energy it's absorbed but retinal itself doesn't acquire any mass because the, the photon does not give it mass, only momentum and energy. Right? So the mass of the retinal is 284 AMUs after absorption. So now when you're talking boxcars, yeah, your boxcar set is now four boxcars, and you've changed the <coughs> excuse me, you've changed the momentum state of the entire set of boxcars. 
but and, and also the mass has changed. But this one, the mass hasn't changed. It's still 284. All right, so go ahead and make a quick calculation. And we'll go over the calculation um, slowly so you can kind of see what's, what's going on. I remember when I was a kid, you know, like in, in elementary school, my, my uncle was a physicist and my dad was an attorney. But they talk, I remember hearing them talk about photons, pure energy, or in this case, pure momentum. It's kind of weird. My dad was an attorney, but he would always, he always loved talking about he loved talking about anything. He's kind of an omnivorous, mentally omnivorous person. All right. 20 seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one, zero. Okay, uh, go ahead and display that. Now, on this, we have a variety, a, a range of answers, all right? But it's not that difficult. So, what we're going to go ahead and switch it back to laptop. Thank you. Uh, what we're going to do now uh, is explain this answer. And the largest group, 45%, so not a majority, but a plurality, they call it. I did vote for this, but a significant, the majority of class did vote for something other than 0 0.25. So let's work it out. Okay, we get a shot of delta P. So that means uh, final minus initial, all right? And we know that the final is going to be some positive speed, but the initial is zero because it's at rest. So make a note. PF minus 0, 0.0, and I'm just putting in a AMU meter per second for my units of momentum. Nothing, nothing great shakes about that. That's just, you know, all right. Now, that is supposed to be equal to, according to the, the question, the statement of the question, the story of the story problem, uh, that's supposed to be equal to 71.0. AMU meters per second. All right. So delta P is basically equal to PF. So PF has got to be equal to 71.00 AMU meters per second. All right. Uh, and so now... By definition of momentum. This is equal to mv for the retinal molecule. Right? So mv for the retinal molecule is 284 AMUs for m mass and vf, whatever the final speed. That's what we're trying to figure out. Okay? And so if you look at that now, you can see, okay, yeah, I just got to divide both sides by 284 AMUs. Here we go. VF is equal to 71.0 over 284. And hopefully you can spot that that's equal to 0 0.25 uh, without doing any, without hitting your calculator. But it's pretty simple. If you do, use your calculator. All right, it's so just 0 0.25. All right, and I meant that, I made that one up um, so that you would have a fairly um, cinchy number. Now, a couple things I want to point out to you about this. I gave you some instruction about atomic mass units. All right. And atomic mass units are in this equation, but they're not really doing much. I mean, they're just kind of sitting around on both sides of the equation. So up here, um, oops, wrong. Go through this again.
Okay, up here, uh, yeah, you could cancel them out up there. Or if you're down here in the in the quotient, yeah, you can cancel them out high and low. You know, cancel them out left and right, set of the equal signs up on the middle uh, line of all those equations. Or do it down here in the last line uh, above and you know, numerator and denominator, they just, so it's not like some great shakes, you know, I could have given you, you know, we could have, uh... here's something interesting, we could have done colliding galaxies, had a, gal... you know, when, when we use the Hubble Space Telescope to look out into the universe, and look at galaxies, and quasars and uh, you know look for black holes and supernovas and stuff we can see galaxies and, and matter of fact our galaxy the Milky Way galaxy and the nearest spiral galaxy um, the Andromeda the great spiral nebula in Andromeda M31 which is visible on a clear night in the summer uh, they're interacting gravitationally so they're exchanging delta P but for galaxies, extremely big ob objects, you know, you would not um, calculate the mass. You definitely wouldn't calculate the mass in AMUs. You could do it, but why would you want to? Similarly, kilograms. Yeah, you could measure the mass and work with the mass of a galaxy if you're trying to figure out its interaction with another galaxy. Uh, you could do it in kilograms if you want, or grams. And it's true, people do that. But most of the time, you know what we do? We uh, use the solar mass, the mass of the sun. Because we have a good idea of the mass of the sun. And so whenever we talk about an astronomical object, you know, like another star, it might be two times the mass of the sun, or two solar masses. And a galaxy would be, um, you know, a few hundred thousand, a million a few million, maybe even a billion for a big galaxy, times the mass of the sun. So, um, so the energy units, or excuse me, the mass units, as you can see here, it, it's 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 consistent, but it doesn't really add anything. So, so you know, it's just nice to know um, the atomic mass unit system. And we're not going to do any gravitational calculations of galaxies and stuff. Although maybe for homework, I might set something up. Because you can look up all these galaxies and the distances and this, the relative speeds and stuff, for some of them anyways. So I might, do so I might do some galaxy stuff in the next homework, in this homework coming up this weekend. That might be a nice problem. But anyways, it's basically like this. Same. And that's the, that's the usefulness of it. You know, what we learned with boxcars and have now applied basically to molecules, you can also do it for uh, galaxies and anything in between. And that's why I say that the momentum view is, is frequently the best and easiest way to analyze complex physical systems. Now, I want to talk about coordinates and dimensions in space-time, or as they say in Doctor Who, time and relative dimensions in space, TARDIS. Um, and... With this, I'm going to lead you into um, uh, a view of energy that hopefully makes some sense. And it's, this is also kind of parallel, a different discussion to what you see in Chapter 4 in the discussion of energy. So hopefully between this lecture and, and reading Chapter 4, you'll get a good idea about energy. So one of the things that we do with a co coordinate system we set it up so that we can compute things and make diagrams, you know, so get curvatures and distances and, you know, accelerations if, we're, if we got some forces acting. And uh, we do that for various events, and that's what coordinate systems are for. It. Um, now, usually in this class, we use rectangular or rectilinear coordinates, X, Y, and Z. Uh, that we talked about, but you know, it could be some other curvilinear, like a spherical coordinate system, you know, latitude and longitude and, and radial distance r from the center. 
Um, now, um, Einstein said, all right, do that, but you've got to use four, and time has got to be the fourth dimension, all right? And you can't just use time as some kind of a bookkeeping tool, you know, that you use to annotate a calendar or a checkbook or anything like that. And basically, unfortunately, uh, that is the way that Sir Isaac Newton viewed time and everybody up until Einstein. You know, nobody thought about time as another dimension. They thought of it as just, you know, something that, you know, you could all agree on as long as the, the t clocks are synchronized, you know, and everybody agrees, you know, okay, this is September 31st, 2017, or whatever the date happens to be, you know, and just keep your clocks synchronized. Everybody's, you know, everybody's bookkeeping is going to add up. But Einstein said, well, yeah, that's nice. Time does go by at 60 minutes per hour uh, for everybody, uh, but actually, if if you if you want to totally understand the grand book of the universe as a space time, you have to um, use time as the fourth dimension. So, and and here's the here's the uh, money quote. And this is the payoff. In some way, we and this is where you're scientific judgment, your mathematical skills come into play. You've got to treat time in whatever physical problem you're working on, whether it's a rocket, a baseball, two electrons interacting, a molecule. You've got to treat time as if it were an X, Y, or Z coordinate, as much as is possible. And what Einstein found was, you know, the, for instance, his whole theory of relativity uh, the beginning of his theory of relativity, you know, in which he emphasized the four-dimensional structure of space-time, uh, was based on a, a thought experiment. He said, what if you are in a, in a streetcar in Zurich, Switzerland, which is where he lived, and the streetcar is going at the speed of light? down the street. So it's a pretty fast streetcar. Now a streetcar is one of these things in the olden days, they're like little trains the size of a bus and they would go on tra train tracks through cities and stuff. I guess they still have them, um, streetcars in some places like San Francisco, but anyways, streetcars. So streetcar go to the speed of light. So, so here's what he was thinking. All right, he, he says, all right, I'm in a streetcar going down uh, Main Street at the speed of light and I go past Starbucks and my, my lab assistant is standing there at Starbucks drinking his coffee and he has a flashlight. All right. And the sun hasn't risen so you can see the light. You know, it's, you know, so the flashlight shines in the darkness. So he's going down the street at the speed of light and he's in the streetcar and his assistant is at rest. And the, the assistant shines a light in the same direction as the streetcar. So Einstein said, all right, if I was on the sidewalk with him, I'd see a light shine. But if I'm traveling at the speed of light, how would I see light? And the answer to that question, you know, the streetcar moving at the speed of light, what does the observer see, is the theory of relativity. <coughs> the most essential part, or the, the beginning part of the theory of relativity that makes everything possible, all the revolutionary things that he discovered, is simply this. You cannot use the Pythagorean theorem with time the same way you use Pythagorean theorem with a squared plus b squared equals c squared. If one of your dimensions, if, if, if your right triangle has a time-like, has a, a temporal distance, a temporal uh, size, you have to put a minus sign. Let me, let me restate that so you can write it down. The kicker 
in the theory of relativity is that this, the Pythagorean theorem acquires a minus sign if your triangle has a temporal size. So if you, if you, so in other words, a duration. All right, duration, it's not just bookkeeping, it's, it's a dimension. All right, a duration, delta t. You can't put, de, you can, so you can't go um, delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta t squared. He said, nope. It's got to be delta x squared minus delta t squared. And that's where all the cool effects of relativity begin. That is the kicker. A minus sign in the revised Pythagorean theorem. In other words, how do you, how do you calculate a distance, which is what I talked about in 1A here, in four-dimensional space uh, with, and time being the fourth dimension? you got to have a minus sign in the Pythagorean theorem. It, it works kind of cool. Now, last time we talked about this, uh, the space-time position, and I usually use um, time in the very first slot of all the four. Uh, the energy-momentum vector would have the three spatial momenta, Px, Py, Pz, and then um, I and my astrophysics types colleagues usually put energy in the very first slot. So it's the first of four dimensions. Other people uh, put energy in the fourth slot so that the three spatial momenta are, you know, one, two, and three, and then time is number four. Uh, now, we talked about that last time. Now I want to make with you a simple space-time graph and we're going to analyze a space-time graph using the impulse formula. So uh, what I want you to do is make a, si a sideways, a horizontal axis, x. And up here, uh-oh, I've got a problem. You can't see that text. I moved it out of the way and I forgot to put it back in. Okay, up here, um, I want you to put in the time axis. Now, my notation that you can't see is the vertical axis is the time axis. And to make it consistent with the x axis, which is measured in meters, we're going to add a C in front of the time coordinate. C is the speed of light, by the way. Go ahead and make a note. You know that famous formula, E equals MC squared. C is the speed of light. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So the speed of light times the time is a distance. So you can think of this vertical axis. It's the time axis. It's got a C in it for convenience. And you can think of it as uh, time and... Uh, and the distances as light years, all right? All right so that's my light years axis. My, but I'm, I'm still going to call it time. That's my time axis, my temporal axis. Now, the impulse formula, okay, I've got my CT axis vertically, and I've got my x-axis horizontally. And now what I want to do is think about the impulse formula. We've used it already. It came out of Newton's second law. It works great. It's good for trapezoids uh, in the uh, hidden figures uh, procedures that NASA and everybody else uses. Delta T. Let's put in some delta T's. And they're actually going to be C delta T's. All right. So go ahead and draw in a few vertical, a few horizontal lines. Try to make them equally spaced uh, above the x-axis, the spatial axis. All right. And the distance between each line is c delta t. Okay. So those are my temporal increments. And so the impulse formula 
comes out of Newton's second law, and it's talking about delta t. Little increments of delta t get you equal increments of delta p. So everything's nice. Right? And that, so we, we know that from chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, the impulse formula, very nice. And if you map it out on a space-time graph, it's really a discussion about these horizontal slices going up, 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 or down, you know, below the, the x-axis if you want. Okay, ours are just, we just mapped out four of those horizontal slices. Everything, every position on those horizontal slices has the same time coordinate. So that's the same day, or the same second, or the same microsecond, or the same year, whatever your you know, time is measured in. And we haven't really specified it. But anyways, uh, F delta T equals delta P, the impulse formula, is, makes a lot of sense with this kind of set of delta T's. Right? Now, what if you partition up space-time the other way? In other words, it's, it, you could do graph, I mean, it's just graph paper. It's, you know, kind of fancy graph paper. What if you do equal delta x's? And I've done mine up in the first quadrant, you know, to the right of the temporal axis and above, pretty much above the spatial x-axis. All right, and, and that's another way, uh, you know, another set of divisions that's natural in space-time. Delta T is fine, you know, horizontal slices, yep. We know laws of physics that apply on those horizontal slices. So the question then um, uh, uh, appears, um, how does nature behave under this partition? In other words, spatial slices... Uh, where the x-coordinate, you know, like, for, for instance, this first vertical dashed line, x is equal to, like, one meter, maybe, or uh, one mile, or one light year, or whatever you want to, you know, whatever distance unit you want. And everything along the second vertical line is two meters, or two miles, or two light years. You know, everything up here, that's what that symbolizes. So what kind of law shapes itself and shapes nature's motions um, using delta x? And we know what it, you know, we know the law that nature has, the backbone of nature that uses delta t's. Okay? And Einstein says, if whatever you do with delta x, you ought to be able to do with delta t. He says it's you know, time is not just uh, chopped liver. It's not just a nice little thing so that everybody gets to the party at the same time. No, it's a space. You know what it is? Think of it this way. Time, one second ago, is a location in space time. It's distance from you is one light second. The amount of time light travels in one second. There are 500 light seconds between the sun and the earth. It takes, it takes sunlight about 500 seconds to get to us. So a second ago is a light second. 500 seconds ago, eight minutes is as far from you as the sun is. And what we're, it seems like eight minutes ago, we were right here. I mean, spatially, we were still in the same place. But temporally speaking, boy, it's as far away as the sun. So if you think about distance and time in that way, it leads to you know, a lot of interesting things. And this question is going to lead us 
to something interesting. So let's take a look at what it leads to. Here's what it is. F times delta x is something called the change in the kinetic energy. Another word for that is work. So F delta t is delta p, change in momentum. F delta x is change in kinetic energy. Now, the definition of kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Raise your hand if you've had calculus class. The definition of momentum is p equals mv. The definition of kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Those of you that have had calculus, do you see anything in the, in the relation of those two equations? It's like, a, it's like a derivative. All right? So kinetic energy, so to get this formula, you know, from a diagram of forces and trajectories along the x-axis or something, you've got to do some calculus. But this is the result. Capital W is known as the work. Work is equal to F delta X, the change in the kinetic energy. A force acting across a distance. So you have to have some path that you're moving on. You know, you're sliding across a table, that's delta X. You're moving up and down in the gravitational field of Earth, that's delta Y. All right? You're going around in a circle uh, around the Earth, that's, uh, well, there's... Change in latitude, change in longitude on your orbit. If you're a circular orbit, the R is constant. There's always, if work is being done, if kinetic energy is changing, either increasing or decreasing, there's some F delta X. There's some work being done. All right? And these are the things that are equal. So, so if delta X's are equal and the forces are equal, like for a weight force maybe, then um, the changes uh, in kinetic energy are equal, just as F delta T, the changes in momentum are equal. But this one's a little bit different uh, because what we're going to find is that there are two different flavors of energy. There's kinetic energy and potential energy. And I'll go into that in just a minute. But before we do, let me pause for questions because this is, I don't want anybody to be ultra mystified by this. Okay, let's keep going. The metric unit of work is called the joule. One half, 1.00 kilogram meter squared per second squared. Because it's a mass times the square of a speed. Now, momentum, kilogram meter per second, did not have a fancy name of its own. But kinetic energy and work, yes. The metric unit of work is, is called the joule. After a, a guy named James Prescott Joule that we'll probably talk about on Tuesday. Chapter 5. K equals 1 half mv squared. So a half a joule is 1.0 kilogram object moving at 1.0 meters per second of speed. Okay. So that's, the, that's just the, uh, the unit of work. Uh, side note. And we'll talk more about these in a, in a, next week and, and the weeks after that. Side note, number one, another unit of work in the metric system is the calorie. A calorie. But that's usually defined in terms of thermal behavior, not motion. Right? A calorie is defined as the amount of energy it takes to heat up a gram of water by one Celsius degree. Another unit not in the metric system, the BTU. BTU is an energy or work unit, British thermal unit, BTU. And it is the amount of energy required to, to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one Fahrenheit degree. 
And that's the British thermal unit. And you see BTUs uh, used uh, for the rating of um, uh, air conditioners and big appliances and stuff sometimes. All right, BTUs. Another work unit. The ERG, E-R-G, all right, now that's a centimeter, uh, let's see, that's a gram centimeter squared per second squared, okay, so that's a little, that's in this, using centimeters and grams instead of meters and kilograms, but for meters and kilograms and seconds, yeah, this is it, Joule. Second side note, the Joule is the same as a Newton meter. So 1.00 kilogram meter squared per second squared. Hey, that's how you calculate it, a force times a distance. Okay, a force is Newtons. Distance is a meter. Okay, so you're, you know, a one Newton force acting across one meter of distance. All right, so if, you ha if you're pushing something uh, for using one Newton of push force across one meter, so across, uh, halfway across this tabletop, uh, then that would give um, an extra uh, 1.00 kilogram meter squared per second squared uh, of kinetic energy to the object, or one newton meter. So my 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 admonition to you is this: when you're working it with work units of work or units of energy, be agile. Sometimes, and especially if you're working on a calculation, sometimes you want to use kilogram meter squared per second squared. Sometimes it'll be easy to cancel things if you work in Newton meters. And sometimes all you need is joules, so capital J for joules, all right? So, uh, and we'll do that from time to time when, uh, when we do calculations with energy and so forth and try to figure out distances and speeds and stuff. We'll do cancellation and sometimes we'll want kilogram meters squared per second squared. Sometimes we'll only want newton meters and sometimes we don't even care. We'll just use joules, All right? Now, another quantity that's important with interactions is something called potential energy. And I'm going to use the um, idea of a baseball uh, rising up on its way to the outfield. As it rises, it loses kinetic energy. And where does the kinetic energy go? Well, it, it's, it's lost to the gravitational field of Earth. You can think of it that way, all right? If we define potential energy as minus F delta X, you know, kinetic energy work is F delta X. Potential energy minus F delta X, it works out great. Or minus F delta Y for a baseball. You know, and, and your force in this, in, in 2B, uh, the force is the weight force, Mg. And here the minus sign is hidden in G. And this one, yep, you have to be careful of the minus signs because a rising baseball and a falling baseball um, is a big difference, all right? So the gravitational potential energy at the surface of the Earth is defined as minus mg delta y. And in that one, g is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, right? So the gravita so these are the two things. You know, I, I mentioned in that space-time diagram, okay, delta T slices of space-time, good, impulse equation, nice. Delta X slices vertically in space-time, good, work, F delta X, kinetic energy slices, and also potential energy. And you may say to yourself, Dr. B, it's all you're doing is adding a minus sign, but yet it's important because this 
in, in the gravitational field of the Earth, if you don't have any, if you ignore air resistance and friction, which is kind of a form of uh, air, air resistance is a kind of friction, um, if you ignore that, then um, whatever the baseball loses from its kinetic energy goes into potential energy and vice versa. And so we can model, for instance, the ballistic arc of a baseball as an exchange of energy. So that means, for instance, every joule of kinetic energy that's lost on the way up goes into a joule exactly, one for one, of potential energy, gravitational potential energy. If you're on the way down, vice versa, a joule of potential energy lost on the way down increases the kinetic and, and that's what happens. When you're on the way down, you're gaining kinetic energy. So if we think of this uh, free fall trajectory as an exchange of energies, potential to kinetic, you know, whatever potential loses, kinetic gains, whatever kinetic loses, potential gains, you know, on the way up or on the way down, then everything works out great. Now let me uh, point out to you, in this equation, go, go ahead and make a few side notes here, for the GPE equals minus mg delta y. Now in that you have to remember that g is a negative number. So if delta y is positive, right, so write down delta y positive, the change in the potential energy is positive, right? Because you have delta Y positive, mass positive, you have a minus sign out in front, and then you also have a minus sign in the symbol G. Right? So that's two minus signs, they're all multiplied together. So GP is positive on the way up, right? So delta Y positive, you're rising, GPE increases. And what decreases on the way up? Kinetic energy. Right? But GPE increases. Right. Side note number two. If, if delta Y is negatory, uh, delta Y negative, rising or falling, I should have made a question about, a clicker question for this. Delta Y negative, you're rising or falling. Delta Y negative. You're falling, yeah. Okay, so you're falling if delta Y is negative. All right. Now, let's look at the negative signs in, in this formula. Okay, you got a negative delta Y. G is a negative 9.8. M is a positive, and there's a minus sign in front of it all. So that's three minus signs multiplied together, negative. Right, so when delta Y is negative, GPE is also negative, or you're losing GPE, right? And for that reason, the total energy, which is the sum of the kinetic and the potential, is a constant. And this last um, equation, E equals KE plus GPE, here it is in large letters, um, that's known as the conservation of total mechanical energy. Let me repeat that. This formula, E equals KE plus GPE, is known as the conservation of total mechanical energy. All right. Now, that's, that is always a true statement if you neglect stuff like friction that dissipates energy or air resistance which dissipates kinetic energy. Uh, so it's kind of an idealization. But for instance, out in space, you know, a satellite, very small amount of air resistance. You know, they can actually measure some, some atmosphere up there where the space shuttle is and the space station. Uh, and those, if you ever hear of old satellites and old spacecraft, their orbit's degrading and they're worried about it crashing into a city or something. 
That's because, yeah, there is some, even up there, two, 300 miles up, there's a little bit of atmospheric drag. It's not very much, but over the course of many years, it'll degrade the kinetic energy, and, and, you're, and then you get down to thicker parts of the atmosphere, and you lose even more. And you, and you spiral down even further into the thicker and thicker parts of the atmosphere. Eventually, yep, you splash down the ocean, you crash into the land somewhere. Now let's work out some examples of energy levels in Earth's gravitational field. All right, and we're going to use a fairly simple model. Um, we're just going to talk about a two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew. All right, and we're going to take it up to 10 meters height, and we're going to hold it. All right, so this is 10 meters. Uh, so that's like up here on the second. No, it's a little bit tall. Maybe the top of this building. So actually, anyways, 10 meters is maybe second floor here or maybe the top top of the building. All right, so you're up there with a, a two-liter bottle of Mountain Dew. So it's about two kilograms. All right, so so write down mass equals two kilograms because it's mostly water. And you know, did you ever notice that you're paying for water with a little bit of sugar and a little bit of can you believe it? You know what they put in, in soda pop to make it bubble and fizz? You know what they put in it? Acid. Carbonic acid. So when, you t when you're drinking soda, you know, your mom says, don't drink, you know, you know, most moms, they don't want you to drink soda. I don't blame them because all you're drinking is water with, with some sugar in it and some acid. And a little, bit of, you know, a little bit of flavoring, you know, lemon lime flavoring or whatever it happens to be. It's not very good. Anyway, so you're up there 10 meters and you're holding it so kinetic energy is zero joules up at that level. All right, here's another clicker question. I guess I have one more. I do have another one. Have your clicker out. What's the gravitational potential energy at 10 meters elevation? for a two kilogram object, all right? Here's your question. GPE equals mg del minus mg delta y. So you're going from zero to 10 meters, okay? And you're holding it. So it's it has potential to move, but it's not moving yet. It won't move until you actually let go of it. So mg delta y. And I've actually answered part of it here. All these numbers, one of these is correct, and they're all positive. So delta y is positive, so the change in the potential energy is positive. Okay, 30 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one, zero. And it looks like you guys did a good job. Yeah, uh, 196 joules. It, it, look, it's just 2 times 10 times 9.8. 2 times 9.8 is 19.6. 10 times that is 196. Okay. So that's the Cinchy one. So let's get back to our diagram. Okay, energy levels up there at 10 meters, and you're holding on to it. Now, if you were to throw this thing up in the air or downward, and you're trying to bomb somebody or you're trying to bomb a gopher 10 meters down below you, then you'd have kinetic energy. But if you're just holding on to it, zero kinetic energy. 
Potential energy is 196 joules. All right. That means the sum of those two is 196. So the total mechanical energy is 196. You can use that row and figure out any other specific level. The kinetic energy, the potential energy. Once you've got the, uh, once you've got one row, you can fill in all the other rows that you want. And the reason for that is the total energy will be the same everywhere. So just before impact, down here at the bottom, okay, see so we start, you're up there holding it, and then you drop it. And 10 meters down just before impact, here's what you got. No potential energy all kinetic and they add up to 196 all right so in terms of a table okay this is kind of kind of a sketch a diagram annotated diagram in terms of a table this is what it looks like and your table you can put ditto marks all the way down One ninety six all the way down, because at every level, if energy is really conserved, which in this case it's it's a pretty good approximation, not much air resistance, okay, um, you'd be able to figure out potential energy and then kinetic. So what you would do if 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 you want to figure out kinetic energy here, then first figure out potential energy over here. And the reason that you can do that, my wonderful students. Make a note. This is important. So this is, this is a note, not a side note. Note. Potential energy is the energy of position. <coughs> Gravitationally, once you have the mass of the two objects in the relative position, you can figure out the potential energy. Potential energy is the energy of position. In an atom, the energy levels of an atom are about electrical potential energy because the, ener the atom is held together by the electromagnetic interaction, not gravity. And that being the case, if you once you get total energy at any level, you can put ditto marks everywhere. Then you can calculate potential energy, mg delta y, for each, each, each different elevation, whichever one you want, and then subtract that from 196, and that'll be your kinetic energy column at that level. Let me ask you a question. I want you to think. Now, I just told you that at 8 meters, for instance, you can calculate potential energy. You know, M times G times 8. Okay, so let's see. Let's, fig let's figure out what that would be. What's 16 times 9.8? 150. 156.8, is that what everybody's getting? Okay, so 196 minus one. 56.8. Okay, that's so that's about 198 minus 150. So that's about 32. 39.2. So 39.2 would be your kinetic energy. 39.2 joules. So let me ask you this. Okay, 8 meters, 156.8 joules of potential. And what was the other one? 39.2. Okay, 39.2 joules of kinetic. If you know that you have 39.2 joules of kinetic energy at 8 meters, at the position 8 meters, could you figure out what V is? The speed? The downward speed? Yes, no, or maybe. 
Could you do it? 39.2 kilogram meter squared per second squared equals kinetic energy. Can you figure out what V is in the formula 1 half mv squared? Yeah, you could figure it out because you know what the mass is, 2 kilograms, right? So you could figure out what V squared is and then figure out what V is, right? Now, homework 9 is going to uh, get you some more uh, practice with tables of this sort, uh, in, except they're going to be using a basketball. And uh, it's going to be lovely. Uh, let me uh, reemphasize that um, SI is running today at 1.30, tomorrow at 11.30. I want you to do some reading ahead into Chapter 5 as much as you can. Um, this beautiful picture. And I'll see you next Tuesday. You're dismissed, 11.39. And you can close this session and grade it.